Okay, this is an interview many months in the making. I share a friend with a famous adult actress, Janice Griffith, and I wanted to interview her years ago, and we kept meeting to do the interview, and then we would both get too stoned to do the interview and then end up not recording anything. And then she moved to Berlin, then she came back, and I decided, okay, this is the opportunity to do it and not get stoned. We did get stoned immediately after the interview was done, and it was probably more interesting than the actual interview, or at least it felt that way, but, you know, I I, I tend to not be intoxicated during interviews. Maybe I should uh, experiment with doing an interview while stoned, but that's not really my style. This interview is about drug use, adult entertainment, sex, and the many convergences between the world of pornography and the world of drugs. I think the world of pornography is endlessly fascinating in the way that it's treated culturally. Something like sex that, at least in its typical manifestation has no reason to be taboo, right? I mean, arguably, sex has a lot less reason to be taboo than drug use. Drug use is, whether you like it or not, occasionally responsible for death, and people do ruin their lives through their relationship with drugs, and it is not necessary to human functioning, whereas sex is necessary for the survival of the species, and every person exists as a result of sex or some sex-like act. Maybe I suppose there are ways of conceiving without sexual intercourse, but obviously the norm for the generation of new human beings is sex. And yet the idea of having sex with another person, recording it on camera, and making it available for public viewing is shockingly taboo. And anybody that does this must have something terribly wrong with them. And it is one of so many things in our culture that we have somewhat arbitrarily sanctioned and dismissed. In this conversation, we get into the overlap in the politics of respectability, which I think plagues both the world of pornography and the world of drug use. If you are part of an ecosystem that is stigmatized by the dominant culture, you feel it is your responsibility to show that you're not one of those bad drug users, you're not one of those damaged, abused porn stars, you're, you're doing it because you love it, you're doing it because it's good. You have a really constructive relationship with drugs, you only use sacred plant medicines. You're not one of those people that uses heroin or meth, right? So in both worlds, there is this sort of insecurity that you sometimes see where People are so used to being criticized that they want to show that they are not what you think. But even if people do conform to stereotypes in the realm of drug use or the realm of pornography, so what? I've always been interested in the idea of hardcoreness, of unsimulated acts of one kind or another in film. I remember when I was in high school hearing about and watching the movie Cannibal Holocaust and hearing that all of the killing of animals in this movie was real and seeing it and being completely shocked, shocked that they could film such a thing, shocked that it would be in the final cut of the film. But animals are killed routinely. So why is the depiction of the killing of an animal in a piece of art so taboo? Would it be a problem if the filmmaker just said, I was in a jungle and was with people when they killed a turtle? No, no one would care. And in my various travels, I have witnessed a enormous amount of animal sacrifice. I've had chickens killed on my body. I have watched more chickens being beheaded than I can count. I've had a guinea pig rubbed all over my nude body. I've um, watched some pretty gruesome pig slaughter, and on and on and on. And almost none of these shots have ever made it into a final cut of something that I've made. There was actually one shot that I think was one of the most spectacular things that was ever filmed for my show, which was 
just, you know, this kind of million dollar perfect shot of a chicken's neck extended across the frame with a machete coming down and severing it and rockets of blood squirting out in the midst of a buiti aboga ceremony. Now, we didn't ask anybody to kill this chicken. It's part of their tradition, and it looked spectacular on camera. So why can't we show it? It happened, but for some reason, the hardcore animal sacrifice can't actually be shown. And I've always been fascinated by the art pieces that do contain these sorts of unsimulated acts. Some of you may be familiar with the Nicholas Rogue film Performance, which is widely rumored to have unsimulated sex as well as an enormous amount of unsimulated drug use. The rumor is that James Fox smoked DMT before a number of the scenes and was so impacted by performing in performance that he completely stopped acting for years. And then there's the Gaspar Noé film, Love, which we talk about in this conversation, which not only features unsimulated sex, but as a overarching theme, discusses this question of why a romantic film can't include realistic depiction of sex. I think it's interesting that we draw these lines between what is acceptable for an actor to do in a performance and what is unacceptable. If Christian Bale loses 62 pounds to star in The Machinist, we congratulate his commitment. But if he were to have put another man's penis in his mouth, that would be unacceptable. So the life-threatening thing is okay and worthy of applause, but if he put a man's penis in his mouth, that would have been completely unacceptable by international standards. I have always thought of the chemistry that I depict as hardcore chemistry, as nerdy as that sounds. It was important to me that the chemistry be unsimulated. Of course, the task of making the show would have been 1,000 times easier if we just shot close-ups of food coloring mixing in water or didn't actually film people doing the chemistry. But what's the fun in that? And People understand this in the realm of method acting. They recognize that to immerse yourself in something, to make it as real as possible, has a positive impact on the performance. Yet we draw these lines primarily with sex, right? You can count on one hand the number of semi-mainstream films that have unsimulated sex acts in them. And maybe it's because of union regulations, and maybe it's because many actors just would consider this unthinkable, but I think it also has a lot to do with our culture and audiences and these puritanical vestiges in our morality. And I think this is a really interesting conversation because Janice Griffith is a friend. She's a really interesting person. She has an interesting relationship with drugs in that she's probably the person I know who has used the most ketamine with the least detrimental effects. I've known a lot of people who have used ketamine excessively and had problems with it. I've known a lot of people who've used ketamine excessively and at least according to them, the problems that they experience are better than the way things would be otherwise, right? Like maybe ketamine's causing some problems, but if you would be suicidally depressed or even kill yourself otherwise, obviously having some ketamine associated dysfunction is acceptable. But I don't know that many people that use ketamine somewhat regularly who seem to be genuinely very highly functional. And Janice Griffith is one of those people. This conversation touches on all sorts of things, ranging from psychiatry to ketamine telemedicine to an accidental overdose that I had on a chemical that may have been CP55940 or may have actually been the C8 homologue of CP47497. The world may never know. And... So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. It's well known that the cannabis plant contains a wide variety of fascinating phytochemicals. It's one of the most studied plants in the world. And so I'm always amazed when researchers discover new compounds in cannabis. What was especially amazing is that in 2019, a group of researchers in Italy found a new cannabinoid called THCP that is structurally very similar to THC, but it has a seven carbon chain instead of a five carbon chain. The extension of that chain 
gives THCP much greater potency. So at the CB1 receptor, which is responsible for the stoning effects of THC, THCP binds with 33 times higher affinity, making it the strongest known phytocannabinoid. I thought that this would remain a obscure scientific curiosity, and I was amazed to find that within three years of its discovery, techniques had been developed to industrially produce THCP from hemp. I saw that canaclear.com was selling it. I independently ordered a sample, analyzed it via NMR, and found that the material was bona fide. So if you are interested in THCP, Delta 8 THC, HHC, or any other unusual phytocannabinoids, go to canaclear.com. All of their materials are third-party tested for quality and compliance, and if you use the code HAMILTON, you will get 15% off any purchases. Thank you, Canaclear. This podcast is also brought to you by Lucy Nicotine, a company that makes nicotine pouches, nicotine gum, and nicotine lozenges. I particularly enjoy the apple ice flavored nicotine pouch. It is a refreshing and well-formulated product. If you don't already use nicotine products, I recommend you don't begin. They're habit forming. But if you do, I think this is the finest nicotine product on the market. Thank you, Lucy. This podcast is also brought to you by matcha.com. Grab a traditional matcha bowl or your favorite mug and enjoy a hot cup of matcha first thing in the morning. I don't drink coffee, but I think matcha is a wonderful way to start the day. It contains L-theanine, it contains caffeine, which is what I'm most interested in, and it has all sorts of purported health benefits. Matcha.com was founded by psychedelic pioneer Dr. Andrew Weil. All of their matcha is imported from Japan and third-party tested for heavy metals. It's delicious, probably healthy, and certainly stimulating. So enjoy a cup of matcha from matcha.com. And then the other one is the exact same thing. It's just a mirror image. It's like your left hand and your right hand. And then so your left hand is also, he's talking to me about like dextro and sinister and things. I was like, whoa, like I didn't need, I actually didn't need like this much. I just <laughs> wanted to know what it meant. Um, but I thought it was super cute of him, you know? Because like psychiatrists are usually pretty quiet and reserved. Like he's never said like more than three sentences in a row to me before that in five years. This, I mean, this has become like a hugely controversial area because. Uh, well, they just want to patent it and they want to say like, oh, maybe the nausea or whatever bad stuff that's in ketamine won't be in this one if we separate it from the other one. And then it's like a pharmaceutical thing, right? Yes. And no. It. I mean, it is and it isn't. And it's also been a catastrophic pharmaceutical disaster because Johnson and Johnson had like successfully patented and developed and commercialized as ketamine. So then they tried to do the same thing with our ketamine and they did it so unwisely on the basis of this thing called the forced swim test. Do you know about this? Mm -hmm. This is like a really, really, really dumb way of assessing the efficacy of antidepressants where they put a rodent in a cylinder of water and then measure how long it treads water before it succumbs to exhaustion. And and I'm not even saying it's stupid on like a cruelty level. Like obviously you can make a, a pretty, uh, you can make some arguments about cruelty there, but like cruelty aside, it just doesn't work very well. It's like endurance or like the choice to like keep trying isn't it? Like, are they, like what is the, what's the correlation there between? I mean. Cause it's not like. A, like, it's not trying to kill itself. It just has, like... The idea is basically just, like, any drug that causes it to tread water longer will translate to antidepressant activity in human beings. But you can already imagine, like, any stimulant, for example, that, yeah, like, will work amazingly in the force. Yeah, I was going to say that. speed yeah. isn't an antidepressant, but... So then, like, right off the bat, you have this issue. So you can't use stimulants in this test. And, and sometimes ketamine can be stimulating, 
Yeah. Like to some people it's stimulating and to others it's like exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all dose dependent. And and this was really a bad idea. And then it just failed in phase two clinical trials causing the stock price of the company that was developing it to absolutely crash. And people like thought we're gonna give up on the signal research. I mean, that's kind of a concern, like failure, because it's at the end of the day, it's like to get something through phase two costs like I don't even know, probably somewhere in the ballpark of fifty million. But isn't ketamine like such a cheap drug to make? Like it's so worth you know what I mean? Like it's not like they're spending a lot of money on like like I get that tests and stuff cost money, but it's not like the drug costs money. No, yeah, the drug does not pretty much ever cost all that much money, but the cost is insurance, development, the clinical trials themselves cost enormous amounts of money because you need all these physicians and you pay patients and you have to have all this oversight and which is good. Like you want there to be regulation and safety standards in place, but it's uh it's like one of these hard to solve problems where the way to make it more affordable is to reduce regulation. But reducing regulation also makes people more vulnerable to bad uh, stuff. Bad, like to predatory pharmaceutical companies making potentially false claims or not adequately assessing the safety of drugs. Well, it's like, isn't um, in May all of the telehealth um, like rules that were suspended for like the state of emergency for COVID are getting reversed? Like all of these at-home ketamine people are like going to be fucked come May. That's what my psychiatrist said. He's like, all of it's like changing. They're going back to like pre-COVID. I didn't know that it was happening in May. I mean, the, did you see the New York Times just published a giant, a scare story about telehealth ketamine? I didn't, but that tracks because it's way too easy to get. Okay, so I did like an interview or like an intake with this one thing, and they were like, okay, cool. And then at the end of the interview, the intake, the guy goes, actually, like, I recognize you. Like, this is so unethical. I can't do this. And I was like, you didn't think about saying that like five minutes in? Also, how is that unethical? Well, I mean, like, he can't like be... He can't be my doctor if he jerks off to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I I think he can. I'd prefer he wasn't. Okay, okay, that's fair. <laughs> that if you don't like it, that's fair. That's. Totally I mean, fair. I actually I kind of don't care, but I think it's something where like maybe he shouldn't have told me. Like if it doesn't matter, then you don't have to tell me. Actually, I understand what you're saying. I've I've had that happen before as well. Not like I remember I was getting my foot X-rayed. And someone was like, step on something weird, looking for drugs in the Amazon. It's like, you know what? Just x-ray my foot. Can you? I mean, <laughs> you didn't have to say that. No, I... I could have gone my whole life <laughs> without hearing that. And also, I think probably in both of our instances, there's something vaguely unsettling about like a medical professional being into your work. It's yes. where it's like, where it's like, I know what I do. <laughs> and now I know you know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't say that because then we're shaming people. Yeah. And you know <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, of course, it's fine. It's fine, but there's also a little bit like, nah, if I could choose between the doctor that isn't a fan of my show and the one that is, I might choose the one that's not a fan. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, the New York Times story annoyed me because... I didn't read it. But it's... Is this my phone or yours? It's my end. It will probably annoy you. It's just, it struck me as a little too... I'm going to skim it real quick. They're making this claim where they're like, patients are receiving prescriptions from ketamine from physicians after a single consultation without ever meeting them in person. Yeah, that's how medicine works. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's like, did no one point that out at the New York Times? Like, what do you think that normally a psychiatrist hangs out with their patient for a few days and really gets to know them and learns about them before writing a prescription. Like, if you spend five minutes with somebody before writing a drug name on a piece of paper, you're already spending more time than most psychiatrists. Is the New York Times app always this bad? Yes. Like, there's no search? Where do I go to search? I don't know. Uh, I would just do it through Google. Like, I would Google it and then click the link that'll open it in my app. Yeah. That's stupid. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I don't think people understand though that psychiatrists like don't spend time with their patients, like therapists spend time with their patients. There's this like, it's like a running joke that your psychiatrist will come into the room for like five minutes and be like, cool, 
I'm gonna up your dose. Bye. Like, I'm lucky in that, like, I did psychotherapy with my psychiatrist as well as my, like, medication stuff. Right, right. It also has this very unfortunate snitch energy where... Also, had never received FDA approval. Yeah, do you know how many off-label uses for, like, every single medicine we use? Viagra is not an erectile dysfunction medicine. It's blood pressure medicine. Like, now it's erectile dysfunction medicine, but has it been FDA approved for that use? Right. Viagra has been. But it's not, like, Cialis or, you know, one of the very. Oh, it's, I mean, it's just routine. A psychiatrist wrote this. It says, as a psychiatrist. A oh, fucking loser. Yeah, and the, and the one of the patients is, like, claiming that they abuse their ketamine telemedicine prescriptions, but they don't want to tell anyone because they're afraid it will be taken away from them. And it's like, okay, good job telling the New York Times. Like, no, but... that's the... Do you know how much those things cost? Yeah, like, it's insanely expensive. Like, eight treatments is, like, $1,000. Meanwhile, a gram of ketamine is, like, $20. Yeah. Like... And that and that matters. Like this is one of the just things. Take ketamine and pour it into a saline nasal spray, and like you'd have your own little thing. Like you don't have to snort it, but yeah, you could watch enough YouTube videos or like go on Reddit and figure out how to make those little lozenges yourself. Yeah. Like I, I don't know people do crazier shit all the time. Yeah, yeah, and people never talk about that. They always talk about addictiveness of a drug, as is if ketamine the drug is addictive. Like some psychologically, people. but not like. Some people get really lost with it, but not many. But some people do. Yeah, I mean, I I've, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's not obviously. It's not, not me addictive. though. Be safe. <laughs> <laughs> no, you actually seem like you seem to do well. I think I do well. Yeah. The only drug I've ever had a problem with actually is whippets. I got crazy on whippets once. Um. Was this during COVID? Yeah. And you were ordering boxes on Amazon? I was ordering boxes on Uber Eats. Oh, shit. 30 minutes, they're at your house. Wow. You can get a new can, like a new whipped cream machine, too. Like, you could get all of it. And a box of Haichu. Like, it was super fun. Oh, I think maybe I visited you during this period. I think I did a whip it with you during COVID. You did COVID. A whip it with me, but that was, like, before my whip it era. That was the beginning of the whip it era. And it got worse. It got, it got spooky. What was it like? What were you doing? Just so many whippets. But I actually, I got serotonin syndrome, and I think I saved my own life by doing whippets because it was so cold. I was doing it right out of the, the thing, and like, I was overheating, and then I wasn't. Oh right, was this like some the weird pill that you took? Yes. Yeah. The pill was fine. I actually I took another one like of it like a week ago, and it was. It was great, but I took Zofran, which is like an anti-nausea medicine. Right. That happens to interact with serotonin. Yeah. Interesting. And you think that was what did it? Because I took, I had taken half of this pill before and just had a really nice night. And I took literally like not even a quarter of it. And I was like throwing up, like couldn't think like, and I was sick for like three weeks afterwards. Like I went to the hospital. Wow. That's because I've combined Zofran with psychedelics on many occasions without any kind of negative. But psychedelics that don't play. But not a serotonin release or like MDMA. And I haven't. That's interesting. I started taking it at ketamine therapy. Like they give it to you with the shot because ketamine can make you nauseous. Right. Like that's how I started taking Zofran. Right. Wow. Oh, I guess I'd forgotten about that. That's scary. And you think the whippet saved you? I think the whippet saved me. Because I was, like, I'm cooking from the inside out, right? Like, that's what happens to you when you get serotonin syndrome. Um, and, like, I couldn't think I had, like, the confusion. You know how, like, the first symptom is, like, confusion? I couldn't, like, think. I couldn't read. Um, and in my little gremlin brain, I was like, what if we do a whippet, though? And then I <laughs> did whippets for, like an hour or two and I was normal for those two hours and then I stopped doing them and I was like oh I don't feel so good and then I fell asleep do you think there was a delusional element when you were doing it a lot like were you chasing some kind of a fact or was it just the oblivion the like static mindless euphoria yep yeah it was the static yeah I also I got Meniere's like two years ago 
So I spent a lot of time in the dentist's office and a lot of time on nitrous at the dentist. So I got like a taste for the, the nothingness. Yeah. I've never gone full. I've always been very neurotic about nitrous. Like, because you know, in Philly, it's like a thing. Well, so I don't do like breath play whippets. Like I'm not into the asphyxiation aspect of it. Like I like asphyxiation sexually, but not as a whippet thing. Yeah. Like a lot of people are like, oh, whippets. Like I love getting like blasting off and like almost passing out. And I'm like, you're doing breath play, not whippets. Like you could breathe. You don't have to hold your breath. It doesn't make a difference to my understanding of like how we like absorb it. Like you breathe it in and that's it. Yeah. Like holding your breath doesn't make it stronger. It makes you feel more because you're holding your breath. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But it definitely is not necessary to deprive yourself of oxygen to get. Yeah. But so back. every time I've done a whip it, I'm always like, like I love a little breath of air in it. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's a good technique. I mean, because it's usually co administered with oxygen under in a medical setting. Circumstances. Yeah. yeah. And so how did you break out of the spell? I just stopped. I have a pretty, like, uh, I don't have an addictive personality, usually. And at one point I was like, oh, it's getting kind of spooky. You should chill. And then I did. And now I can do it, like, here and there as, like, a little, a little treat. And I don't really have the, um, the desire to go crazy on it yeah that was a pretty common fate during covid there were a lot of people that fell into that because it's legal you can get it delivered to your house like and you know i think it's kind of fucked up but also i got whippets in europe and they were way cleaner they didn't make that your mouth taste bad i wasn't like coughing up weird brown sludge like which the whippets did make me do right yeah there's like some kind of lubricant on the external surface maybe or who knows what yeah I mean, have you ever seen the inside of a whipped cream canister after people do a lot of whipping yeah there's like a brown oil yeah yeah yes that's, yeah that's a little frightening it started to freak me out i started reading so much about the interaction with b12 i was gonna say when you start you stop absorbing b vitamins even if you're taking them because your body can't it's just like destroying them in your body yeah and then you know i was talking with all these people who got really intensely addicted for a while yeah. i had physical withdrawal symptoms really what were they like i was like a little bit shaky i was just like you know like i didn't feel right in my body i felt a little nauseous i had a weird headache there was like this one dentist who i interviewed who had lost his medical practice and had just like lost his family lost everything um, from just like after the doors closed at night, he would just get in the dentist chair and he said it wasn't nitrous oxide or listening to Prince, but the combination, combination of the two was like a sensation so magnificent <laughs> that he couldn't control himself. And he like straight up the like Prince nitrous synergy was like uh, so good he gave up everything and now he like tours medical schools and gives talks about I nitrous know, addiction i know people who have like especially mu musicians who have gotten into nitrous who like they get the sound that like weird like yeah. Mm, yeah. sound they're like chasing that like they're trying to figure it out I find that ketamine does that a tiny bit as well it gives it like a metallic tinny yeah quality but then when you do both Aha! Uh -huh. I don't think I've ever done that. Oh, they're best friends. I can imagine, yeah. I can imagine that would be good. So do you get ketamine from these telehealth companies? I used to. I don't anymore because they recently, like, one of them closed in New York and the other one, I think another one also closed in New York. And then I moved to Berlin, so. And that just doesn't exist in Berlin? Do they have ketamine clinics in Berlin? There's one, but I... I went and I did the intake and I was I was super depressed. Actually, uh, I lost a friend to an overdose over the summer and I was just like, I was having a bad one. So I was like, okay, we're going to try. We're going to go to this clinic. And I went there and the psychiatrist was basically like, you said you have agoraphobia, but you're here. 
And I was like, this is a last ditch resort. Like, I'm like, this is like me, like digging my teeth in, trying to save my own life. And he was like, I don't know, like you seem fine. Oh, are they more conservative? Like they wanted to, they wanted it to be like your last resort. Like you had to be totally dysfunctional in order to qualify or something. I think so. I was like, hey, so they were like, okay, tell me about some of your irrational fears or anxieties. And I was like, I'm scared of gun violence. And they were like, okay, but did you know that the odds of you or someone you know being in a shooting is actually way lower than you would think? Uh -huh. And I was like, first of all, I'm American. Uh -huh. <laughs> so no, it's not. Second of all, both of my parents are police officers, so it's extremely not. Like, I, <laughs> it also doesn't even matter whether or not a fear is rational. And it's I know a fear. It's rational. Yeah. I know it's not like normal. That's why I'm at the fucking psychiatrist. <laughs> like most phobias are not rooted in legitimate concern. No, exactly. Yeah. Even if I know that. My brain, like, it doesn't matter if I tell my brain that because we know it on, like, a surface level, but I still feel it in my bones. Yeah. That's interesting. I guess it just hasn't caught on in, that's in Germany. But yeah. So, in Germany, they're super conservative. Like, there's a running joke that, like, if you go to the doctor and you're dying, he'll be like, have you tried tea? I guess there's a lot of the world. I mean, even in... The also, UK, there's like no Adderall that's really prescribed. They also joke that like Americans love like antibiotics and stuff. Yeah. Which, I mean, personally, I hate antibiotics. Like, not a big fan of taking them, but we love Western medicine. We, we got the rectal kratom guy right off camera right now. I mean, this is what you're telling me. I don't know. That's <laughs> boofing kratom. It's become a meme on the internet. This is a kratom tea product. It's not intended for boofing, even if the pH of the human rectum is between seven and eight, and the pKa of metragenine is 8.1. That's just not really relevant here. This is a tea consumption in hot water. That's what it's for. That's what it should be used for. If you want this tea, you can get it at toptreeherbs.com. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a weird culture. I don't know. Well, a lot of adults, like, don't know how to take antibiotics, which is scary. Like, they don't finish their course of antibiotics, like, especially specifically in porn. Like, there's been, like, three or four instances in my now, like, decade-long career where people have created a fucking antibiotic-resistant super strain of gonorrhea or chlamydia. And it's annoying. Wow. Just because someone took like four days of an antibiotic instead of seven. Wow. Or they take antibiotics all the time as a preventative measure. Wow. I mean, are there are specialist porn doctors, right, who consult with the industry? Are there? Yeah, there are. But like in the last few years... Like, I, I left L.A. I'm kind of out of that scene now. But it's really scary. So we used to have this system. It's called PASS. It's the Performer Accessibility or Availability Screening System. And then our two testing companies or whatever would then report our test results to PASS. But not, like, details. Just, like, a thumbs up or a thumbs down kind of vibe. Like a check or an X. Yeah. Um, so you could go to set and your director would type in your name and see if your test results were good or, you know, you were cleared to shoot or not. Now, no one is reporting results to pass. I think because when they started COVID testing, the COVID tests were 48 hours and our testing protocol is two weeks. So I don't think they knew how to like update the system. Oh. You know, and now they're doing swabs because there's a urea plasma outbreak. I don't even know what that is. It's like a regular bacteria that lives in like all of us that like when it col like colonizes your body or like gets too like the levels are out of out of balance, you get sick. And it's not technically an STI or STD, but it is transmitted sexually. Oh. Huh. It's like having a really shitty UTI is what I've heard. And are these specialist doctors helpful or are they I mean, I assume they're not advising people to take antibiotics continuously. As no, a they're not. Yeah. But there is this one porn doctor guy, and he's like famously kind of a dirtbag. And 
This is someone in LA. Yeah, and you can like go to his office and just get like a steroid shot in your butt to, and like a Z pack to kind of like boost whatever is in your system out. Oh wow! And oh. he's in like a regular doctor's office. Interesting. And are there? I mean, are there situations where just everyone is taking like prep, even if they're so the porn industry is really segregated and or like it's getting better now but it was quite segregated in terms of like the heterosexual and like gay porn sides yeah and like obviously obviously lesbian porn doesn't count as gay porn to heterosexual men right so yeah. like you know none of us have like there are people who don't know what prep is they don't know that you can have sex with people who have hiv if they have like an undetectable viral load like they just don't know that stuff yeah there's still a lot of stigma for like uh, straight performers shooting with trans performers or bisexual male performers. It's getting a lot better now, but um, when I first got into the industry in 2013, it was very uh, stigmatized, and it still is. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's like a fear that a lot of people have just in general. I mean, you're already kind of in this potentially frightening realm i mean i could see people getting even if it's not rational just getting like afraid yeah i mean i get scared all the time of stupid things yeah yeah i mean i find that world very interesting and it has obviously so many parallels with the drug world where it's like just endlessly controversial for reasons that often strike me as unnecessary like or like all these like justifications that people need, which I find like at some point, it, like I just get so tired of listening to people justify why a certain type of drug use is good and should be allowed. And it's like, I don't care whether it's good or not, or I don't care whether it's therapeutic or not, or normal or not, or traditional or not. Like, Well, it's just splitting hairs at that point. Like, oh, when you do this, it's okay. But when someone else does that, it's not. Yeah. Um. And I like the moralizing of things anyway. I think most things are more neutral than we would like like to pretend they are. Like drug use is morally neutral. It's all good and it's not bad. Like I don't believe that it's like the holiest thing like a lot of people do. And I also don't think it's evil. Yeah. And the same with pornography or sex work in general. Right. And it's like, I guess it, the other parallel is that people, there's all this like politics of respectability stuff where like, people feel like in order to be recognized as legitimate they have to say that nothing bad happens or only talk about good things yes. and it's like well no of course bad things happen routinely but this should still be allowed it's like okay even it's okay to do bad things or to accept <laughs> or to accept <laughs> badness as like part of something that is okay part of life part, part of, of life. Re the reality of being human yeah 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 that's uh, that's something that i like struggle with especially with my work is people don't leave room for me to have bad experiences or if i have a bad day at work um all sex work is legalized rape and i'm a digital prostitute who's selling my soul and that's why you know whatever 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 and if you know someone who works at the bank has a bad day at work they're allowed to have a bad day at work but i'm not right Right. Yeah, I could totally see that. I could totally because they're looking for that. Like they want to show that something is unethical so they can be like a savior or like a a like protector. Exactly. A preventer of badness. I um I actually had some fans who were like, Oh, you can tell Janice Griffith is shooting up drugs, blah, blah, blah. And like like it's so clear she's a meth head. And I was like, That's crazy because they were saying they could see track marks on my arms. I had bruises because I get STI tested to shoot. <laughs> like that's what the right. Like that's what that here would be. Right. And it's just crazy because those are like the two drugs I don't, I like don't touch. Like if someone had been like, "You look like you did ten too many whippets," I would be, <laughs> I would be like, "Fuck, <laughs> you got me," you know? Like, uh... like I would think that was funny. I would be like, Pfft. or like. You look like you do ketamine. I'd be like, shit. Got me there. But saying I do like meth, and I was like, I don't even like meth. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I also 
understand that as well. If just people like jumping right to heroin. It's like, then there's a lot, there's a lot of other stuff out there there's that you can have problems with. <laughs> also, like, do you think that as a model, I would start shooting up in the most obvious place? Like, don't people do like between their toes? Yeah, or, you know, any number. I mean, you can also just snort it or whatever. Yeah, why would I do, like, it just seems risky. Yeah. Yeah, how do you deal, like, I remember during COVID, you posted something that was, like, a message from someone who was writing to you, and they were saying something like, I am, like, an ICU nurse, and if you won't let me go down on you, like, I'm going to let people die or something like that it was like yes. it was like some something like i think it actually it was something close to that if not that no it, <laughs> it was um i recently got a message that was like you're letting me die in syria in this earthquake and not sending me porn <laughs> and i was like why not buy some uh, like how do you deal with the craziness um it like it rolls off of me like water on a duck really yeah genuinely i just like i do i feel nothing kind of um which is why i think i'm perfect for this kind of uh work and like living in an online world that's admirable <laughs> like i think it's a little bit like crazy and uh like i have a sort of detached like whoa you're crazy kind of reaction to it but i don't i don't get like offended um I get a little bit offended when I feel more misunderstood in a genuine way. Mm. But when it's like totally out of left field, I'm like, whoa, seems like a you problem. Yeah. I know that's easy to say, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any like major misconceptions that you feel are widespread and. Um. Sometimes people are surprised that I'm nice huh. or like down to earth, I guess. Like not super uh, about a high horse or however you want to describe it. Like people expect me to be really self-centered and um, high ego. And I don't know, like I meet people all the time and they're like, wow, you're nothing like I thought you would be. And I'm like, I don't know how you thought I would be. Like, I have no idea how to, you know, manage your expectations or even understand where you're coming from. Do you think that that's only more common than people realize? Because I think maybe the idea is that there must be something about the specific form of sexual worship that every adult entertainer experiences that must produce some kind of psychological effect well it's i mean it's kind of crazy when like sometimes i meet people and they recognize me and i can see their face changing like i can see the gears in their head turning uh-huh. and something like happening to them and sometimes people get a little like wonky like they stop um having any sense of like what is socially acceptable and start saying weird shit like in the club a couple months ago this guy like was like oh my god it's like you're you and i was like i'm me Uh and he was like ah this one video you did and he starts like speaking to me about like details of a porno and i was like if you wouldn't do this to like anyone else why are you doing it to me like i'm at the club i'm not at a convention i'm not at a place where this is like what is expected of an interaction with me do you know what I mean? Was he admiring something in particular? Did he have anything substantive to say? Or was he just like, I thought it was really hot. That It was like, he was like, I love it when you say choke me. And I was like, I don't want, uh-huh. I don't want that right now. I don't want to think about you wanting that right now. I don't want to stand here and feel like this guy wants to choke me. Right. That's spooky. That's a little spooky. Yeah. Like when they, or they're like, oh my God, you're so little. And I'm like, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm like, duh. And these are all things that like in the right situation, I'm like, ooh, fun. But like when you just say it, 
Like they have all of the context in their head of every time they've watched me, every time they jerked off to me, anything they've seen of me on the internet. I don't have that context. They are a person, like a random person. And they kind of interact with me like they know me and they don't. And they think because they have this like intimate like window that I share with them that it means they know me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird relationship that a masturbator has <laughs> with the unknowing source of their masturbatory <laughs> stimulation. Because what can you say? Probably nothing. Like I've never, I don't think I've ever encountered someone in public who... Said they jerked off to you? No, no, I haven't, no. Yeah. What about online now? Online, yeah, occasionally. People are real horny on the internet when people can't see them. Right. And they're, yeah, it's, yeah, it's anonymous. There's no like cost associated with it. Yeah. A little, a little bit of that. <laughs> um, Do people ever um, also feel like they're like, they know you or they have an intimate view like of you because of what you share? Yeah. Which I don't necessarily mind, but what does bother me is when it's judgmental in some weird way, like. This doesn't actually happen as much as it used to, but I used to, like, especially when I was younger, we'd get these messages from people like, I used to be just like you, man. And I know you think you're having the time of your life, having a little coke here and there, uh, having a good time. Wait. Like, but one day it's going to catch up to you <laughs> and you're going to realize those friends that you thought were your friends, well, they're not your friends at all. And the coke's going to run out. And it's like, I don't even do coke. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You're projecting your bizarre, tragic, life trajectory onto me for reasons that are really not clear but um yeah or or now like the entire psychedelic space has become enmeshed in all these like corporate conspiracy theories which i am now constantly being dragged into in a way that's just like like what let's hear one that like i'm an evil corporate shill who is accepting money from Peter Thiel in order to prevent indigenous people from having access to psychedelics or some variation of that has become like a, a prominent one, which is like a result of just pure astroturfing in the psychedelic world. Like this one oil billionaire has invested immense amounts of money into creating this like faux activist crusade to prevent anyone from patenting psychedelics but then himself has psychedelic patents it's just like dumb dumb shit but it's had a big impact on the way that people like see what the what's going on which can happen with porn as well i mean it's like the same deal like all it takes is ted bundy like before being executed saying like porn made me do it exactly. and that and then suddenly that becomes part of the conversation even though it's not real, real. it's just some Thing that a legitimately insane person said who should be the last person anyone listens to about anything at all like right someone who's just lied continuously throughout well, their life just you know separate the art from the artist <laughs> yes like <laughs> saying this because it absolves him of responsibility for his murders as well like there's a clear psychological motivation for making that claim and then it and so there's also um we have a lot of like right-wing christian lobbyists who like regularly try to make at least like pornography harder to make like fosta sesta which like also breaks down internet like laws that help us use the internet in a cool way like the communications and decency act the part where it basically allows forums and user-generated content and it doesn't hold the website necessarily responsible for the stuff that like is on it right in a, in like a good way yeah not in a bad way but they passed this law to like stop sex trafficking online and instead it just like took down a bunch of websites that people were using to like do actual escorting and protecting themselves by not being on the street and using like technology um and then there's this group in Los Angeles the LA um not LA, it's the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. You may have seen their billboards that say like, gonorrhea volcano. You know, those like funny STI billboards in LA. Oh, I think I have, yeah. Yeah, and they own um, Out of the Closet, which is a 
a thrift store and like pharmacy for like the gay community to get free STI tests and like they are a fucking AIDS like research foundation and they show up to Cal OSHA meetings and say pornographers should wear goggles and condoms and gloves and be held to the same standards as waiters and waitresses and maids and or like housekeepers stuff like that and they I once watched them I went to something at City Hall in Los Angeles and everyone inside was wearing matching t-shirts that say like say no on measure whatever and the outside you could tell all these people were from skid row they were lined up collecting visa gift cards one by one like i watched it happen with my own two eyes and that's what a nonprofit organization claiming that they're trying to cure aids is doing with their money and they are a christian organization or what do, why are they doing this i actually don't know if they are christian but they're doing it because they hate porn right it's like mind-blowing that they spent like i once shot with this model and uh her agent didn't pick her up from set we were in malibu my agent came and got me and i was like hey i can give you a ride back to my house and then you can get an uber this is in the year like 2014 or something then this girl was in hot girls wanted like the bad netflix documentary yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the aids healthcare foundation paid her to show up at one of these things and she was sitting there like looking all sad. And I was like, we had sex with each other and nothing bad happened. Like I was there. Uh -huh. Like we were both 18. Like I know, like we were smoking blunts on set. And when we rode home together, you were like, I'm going to take over this industry. They don't know what's coming. And then I, I, and that's not to say that something bad couldn't have happened to her, but it's just, it's crazy the way that like people go out of their way because of a, like, cheap vendetta you know i'm not doing anything to anyone or the way people cloak their interests like making it about aids when it's really about some kind of maybe like moralistic objection to pornography or religious objection or all this kind of astroturfing type stuff is so much more prevalent than people realize how people with major conflicts of interest in one way or another will pose as or even, I mean, the most obvious one would just be like, it's a story for like Rashida Jones or whoever to make it look bad. If it doesn't look bad, it's not a story anymore. Well, the best part of, not the best part, but the craziest things about like Hot Girls Wanted is they used like um, content that like legally they had the right to use. It was like, like legally sound, but of models who didn't consent to be in it. So they made a documentary about like supposed exploitation and used like b-roll footage of models who did not consent and put people who like maybe had 500 followers on twitter in front of millions of people on netflix <sighs> one of them being someone i'm friends with like she was like cool i have to call my entire family and let them know they might see me on netflix because rashida jones is using this content from my free cams or whatever that is legally allowed because of you know she uploaded it to instagram or whatever but it it's not like just because something is legal doesn't mean it's right 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 yeah oh. and the opposite is also true just because something is illegal doesn't mean it's like wrong or bad yeah and is there a reason that you left la and that scene was just annoying Oh, no, I just, like, I left L.A. because I'm from New York, and my uh, sister had a baby last year, uh -huh. and I just wanted to be, like, around my family, um, and it was COVID, and I wasn't, like, shooting very often. Like, I was already on OnlyFans. I was, like, I'm kind of spending a bunch of money to live in a city that I don't love, and I love New York, and I also have wanted to leave America for a while, so I was, like, if I'm going to leave the United States... I want to live in New York one more time before I go. Right. Um, I want to have kids eventually and not send them to school to get shot. That would be nice, yeah. Wouldn't so, it? Yeah. So Germany's better. Um, at least Berlin is a place where I don't have to speak German. Yeah. I have a three-year visa. Um, 
it's a good like starting point so that I can like explore what the rest of the world has to offer me. So I don't know if I'll have kids in Germany, but I definitely won't do it in America. Yeah. And what are you doing there? Like what is like the same shit I was doing <laughs> here? Yeah. Yeah. And is the industry any different there? Yeah, it's more like indie and a little bit cuter. I like it. Oh. There are also Berlin is a good sort of hub. Like we have industry events there. They have conventions and award shows and stuff where like the entire European industry comes together. So that's nice. I don't know. It's it's novel to me still. So I don't know. Talk to me in five years. See if I hate it. Yeah. What about the history of porn? Is that like, have you met any? I'm sure you've met a ton of these legendary. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of people get spooky. Like Ron Jeremy uh, just started doing GHB and wandering around Hollywood Boulevard and groping people. Like, I think he went to jail. Oh, yeah, there were there was a controversy. Yeah, so he, like, groped me once out of a thing. Like, he just came up and, like, grabbed on me. And I, like, kind of pushed him away. He seems to have a glassy, far-off look in his eye. Not a GHB. Like, yeah. literally, there. everyone has a story of, like, watching him, like, almost stumble into the street in Hollywood. Like, he would hang out around the Rainbow Room a lot. Um and just not like just not there anymore interesting is ghb a thing that i don't think so yeah i feel like it's uh too much work for most people to do right and what about weird like do you know anyone that takes bremel lanotide what is it what's like, like pt141 this what is like, it it's like the only drug that is, or maybe one, actually it's one of two drugs approved by the FDA for treatment of uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder in women. It's like an FDA. Female hysteria. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, frigidity. Yo, it's, let me get some of that. <laughs> I I actually have some. I have wanted to try Should it. Should I try it? I mean, <laughs> oh, well, the weird, okay, again, sort of what like... Well, one of the side effects is that it is a sunless tanning agent. So, this is what is it like clay with melanin? Yes, yeah, that was how it was developed. It was actually for sunless tanning in people who were. And his risk. side effect was extreme horniness. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Um, no, I think that. Uh, no, no one I know is taking that, but that's crazy. Yeah. I'm very interested. I want also, I don't understand, but I don't have to understand. It's not something that my brain could. How this works, I don't understand either. I mean, it, it like binds to some melanocortin receptor. Why that induces extreme horniness is not clear to me. Like, I'm sure there's some. Is it like a circulation thing or a hormone thing? The idea is that unlike Viagra, which is arguably not truly an aphrodisiac is just like a vasodilator that bremelanotide is actually an aphrodisiac that it like causes desire desire yeah interesting because sometimes i take um like horny goat weed when because i i'm like fatigued most of the time and i don't love to drink caffeine uh -oh. like i'm not i'm just not really a stimulant person um and i have like medium bat circulation like my hands and feet are always really cold so i went to like a traditional chinese medicine doctor and he was like you should take this and then i like google translated it and it was horny goat weed um so i just take that sometimes and i like it but i don't know how it works it's a pd5 inhibitor like viagra but it's it, just circulation yeah it's a vasodilator same deal yeah because i don't notice like i'm not like horny from it i'm just like a little more energized yeah i know women that have taken Viagra and it doesn't they say it causes like a vaginal rushing sensation <laughs> like it's like a hurricane of blood flow vaginally but it's like they described it as being neither positive nor negative just kind of like is just interesting they seem to lean toward liking it but not in a like not really liking it not loving not loving it <laughs> Um, have you heard of like dudes who have dick implants? Like not for like growth, but for erectile dysfunction. And like, you get like a little pump. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. 
How common is that? Is that a thing? Medium common, I think. Oh, what? I've encountered it like three times on set and once in real life. Wow. I know. And he was like, he started to explain himself to me and I was like, oh my God, actually, I know. I know what this is and you're all good. <laughs> he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, f I'm familiar actually. Aha. <laughs> Oh, man. And there's that other one, uh, the one that, like, Harvey Weinstein was using. Uh, what is it? It's like a prostaglandin that you inject directly into your penis. Ooh. Oh, uh, there are all people who do, um, can we just call them dick injections? It's probably that. Um, there's one, the brand name is Caverject. Yeah, 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 that's it. Which sounds like a super villain cartoon <laughs> comic book name for something you inject into your penis. Casper Jack. You've seen this action. Uh, I've experienced its effects. I don't like, they usually like, go into the bathroom and do it. Right, right. No one, like, there's this huge stigma around needles. Like, it doesn't matter what you're using them for. Yeah. I think it's just, like, society has not gotten over, you know, like, what it's like to have needles. Right. Right. That's interesting. I wonder, I wonder why. I mean, I guess I understand why, but... Well, a lot of people have, like, a bad reaction to it. Like, they get a vasobabel response to just, like, seeing... Oh, no, I mean, like, why you would go all the way to this injection as opposed to Viagra. Oh, it's when, you, when you've when you done all that and it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Right. Wow. I've seen it, actually, the um, the progression from Viagra to the injections to the injections not working, and someone took, like months off and got the implant and said and interesting do you think that it just they that there was any role that being a porn actor played in that or it just was like their medical thing i think it could be uh like a combination of both i think that if you like participate in strenuous physical activity that you know to not be like a hundred percent comfortable for yourself right 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 like it'll have long-term negative effects on your physical health like if i would go to set and have a bunch of sex while i wasn't feeling up to it i would probably accrue scar tissue and like that could lead to you know not getting wet anymore or like experiencing pain and like pelvic floor issues like and even if i'm like just having a lot of sex and i want to do it sometimes it hurts you know like right it just like i've worn myself out enough times to be like all right that's enough so you know i think that there are people who either don't know when to say no or they think they have a strong work ethic you know like anything else like we have this culture of like you have to push yourself to your limits yeah. I don't believe in that. <laughs> I mean, like, one one thing that I hear people say is, like, oh, you know, it's, like, it's 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 never, like, natural sex. Like, this is as much acting as anything else, and it's, like, constantly interrupted and very unnatural. Is that your experience, that it, that it loses any kind of, like, conventional semblance to sex? Yes and no, because at the end of the day, there's, we're still fucking. Yes, you can be detached from it sometimes, but I think that most people who have had sex have had a moment where they're not fully in it and they're like, oh shit, did I leave the stove on? Oh. Or like, I have so much work to do tomorrow. Like, that's normal. It's yeah. normal to like still have thoughts while you're fucking sometimes. Um, so, <laughs> at least it is for me. Oh. Um, but, yeah, and then so it, it really depends on the set because sometimes they they like to be like, okay, we're going to start rolling. You guys are professionals who have worked together 50 times. We'll call cut if we need to, but just go through the whole thing, 30 minutes, and then we'll hit you if we need a specific scene or if something's not working. And then sometimes we'll shoot with no cuts and it'll be really fun and intense and passionate and like... But, the camera just will move around us and work with us. And because we're professionals, we automatically open up to the camera a little bit, or we know what already looks good. We can do natural transitions. Like it just depends on the set. Some of them are really sterile and they're like, okay, 
we want seven minutes of doggy and then this and then they'll pull up a key shot that they're going to use for an ad like so it you know it just depends one thing that i think like seemed very unfortunate to me is this segregation pornography and traditional filmmaking like like porn is ugly or or <laughs> no just that like in a story a conventional romance a conventional film you would never show hardcore sex like that that would be insane well it's like against union rules that's why they oh. wear um modesty garments right genitals can't touch on like sag sets right 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 okay well, that's a, a very good objection but also you know like this is kind of like i really thought love was a good movie because i didn't see it oh it's so good i haven't seen most movies let oh, me just put that out watch there. love it's so good i was i was really blown away by love okay um maybe you won't like it uh, the friend that i saw with hated it but i was like astonished by the realism of every i mean sexually obviously but also even the arguments felt incredibly real and it worked so well they, like it wasn't like oh here's a you know romantic drama but there's also hardcore fellatio it didn't feel like a gimmick it's like no people have sex with each other yeah. like that's part of romance is that people have sex with each other and that sometimes doesn't have to be doesn't have to be doesn't have to be this is true but have like you seen sorry to interrupt have you seen the like recent discourse about i think it started because the guy from the show you on Netflix doesn't he said that he's not going to do sex scenes anymore out of like loyalty to his wife or something mm. like that and a lot of people just took it like why do we even have sex scenes in movies they don't bring any artistic value to the storyline and then other people being like no like people have sex and uh, a lot of it devolved into like a weird puritanical like I didn't consent to seeing this but like we like almost all media in America has like it has content warnings and it has had content warnings for a long time like it says like shows you know yeah nipples and like sexual uh ideas or whatever like but yeah so that's a conversation that's happening um on the internet right now yeah I see that that idea that like nudity is inherently exploitative and you know, it, it makes you somehow like less dignified as an actress to be part of a scene that has nudity and it's always gratuitous. And again, it's like the same, just strikes me as the same deal. It could be, of course, it could be unnecessary. It could be exploitative. It could be gratuitous, but also people are naked yeah, and people have sex with each other yeah. and it's a big part of life. So to just eliminate that or make it abstract because it's somehow really arbitrarily considered taboo in a way that so many other things are not like obviously like extremely accurate simulations of violence are like totally routine and uh well that's what's funny about this specific guy saying it because his character is a serial killer god he's like regularly cutting people up he has a glass box in his basement that he like when he freaks out and accidentally like almost kills someone he'll then keep them hostage and then murder them later but he won't have sex on cam or simulate sex on camera anymore yeah or you know people like you said the w the way people act like it's less dignified but simulating drug use is okay or literally anything else or even like i saw there was like a michael pollan interview on joe rogan and he's talking about making this like, How to Change Your Mind Netflix series. And he's like, oh, I couldn't show myself using drugs. I couldn't. Uh, I mean, obviously, that's ridiculous. And it's like, why, motherfucker? Why? <laughs> you did drugs, but you, you could never, ever show yourself. You can talk about it. You can do it. But to show it, that would just be so unacceptable. And, uh, and even I can't talk about like drug use too much because of the work that I do then it like feeds into this stigma that's like uh, all sex workers are addicts or damaged people who need to get high to get through life. And it's like, I don't want every man. I mean, a lot of people are damaged people that need to get high to get through life who aren't sex workers as well. So it's like, it's only bad when you're a sex worker. <laughs> yes. You know? yeah. yeah. 
I mean, that's a, a pretty common scenario in a lot of the world. And yeah, the, it's, yeah, it's a politics of respectability. It's like, you need to prove that. I'm it, deserving. Yeah. Healthy, positive. Everything is good. Everything's fine. No problems whatsoever. No. Like, I think I also sign, like, I have a couple, like, morality, con like, clauses in some contracts I have that say, like, I can't be um, associated with certain things. Like, taboo sexual things? Yeah. Because it would be bad for the production company or something to be associated with? Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I feel... <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to name names. Uh, 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 <laughs> we on the spot. Uh, uh. What about AI porn? Does that mean anything to you? Okay, so like you can't like where's the consent? So if you like, say you consent to your image being used, like your face, and then the male performer consents to their body being used, then okay, weird, but okay. Um. But like this deep fake porn stuff where they're taking people's faces and slapping it on pornography. I don't think it's cool to the people who made the pornography or uh, and especially not OK to the people that they're sexualizing without their permission. But people are weird and awful and the worst. And people have also been projecting their sexual desires on the closest similar thing or person for as long as people have had sexual desire. Like, I can't tell you how many times I get a message that's like, you look like my girlfriend or the girl at the coffee shop or like, that's why they jerk off to me because mm. I remind them of this other person in their life. Or they'll see another person in their life who reminds them of me or, yeah, reminds them of me and they will seek out relationships with them because they're projecting that onto them. Like, it's not new. It's just a new uh manifestation of an old concept well that's kind of the flip side of the idea that people will say pornography is problematic because it's serving as some kind of sexual template that normal people will follow and so whatever is normal in pornography will then warp people's perceptions and they will seek that out in their personal lives and like the flip side i think is that at least for me like i don't want to see I want the pornography to be close to reality for me. Like I couldn't, like I don't want to watch porn with a guy who's like a muscle bound bodybuilder, like giant, like beefy dude, because it's like, doesn't really, it feels- You can't put yourself in his shoes. Yeah, it's just not like, it's weird. Whereas if it's like <laughs> some like emaciated, like guy in Russia or something. It's like, like a sick Victorian child. <laughs> yes, this story child. I'm like, yeah, yeah, nice, good for him. I can, I can imagine how that would be. Uh, <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, I love it. We don't hold all media to that same standard of example, though. Like, you know, we watch movies about cartels and violence and the mafia, and we understand that it's media. Pornography is held to this weird separate standard where we're left to be sex educators. We're left to be um, intimacy coordinators and teachers and people who tell you what's okay. And the craziest part is people are not consuming all of the porn the way that we make it to be consumed. They're, they're getting little bits and pieces on free tube sites because we are not respectable enough to pay for so they're not even getting, like, the the bigger picture, the context. Like, sometimes scenes have beginnings where we're like, hey, this is what we're doing today. Like, we know each other. We've talked about our yeses and nos and hard boundaries. And when it gets clipped and put on a tube site, they take that part out because no one's watching. Right. But if you would pay for it or if you would think that it was valuable enough to pay for, you would see the bigger picture and then you wouldn't believe us for all the bad stuff in the world. Or may maybe you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's all totally decontextualized. I mean, it's probably a very, very small minority. I guess the OnlyFans change things a little bit, but probably until 
the advent of OnlyFans, it was a very small minority of people that were paying for pornography in any way. Yeah. Except for maybe like renting a video in a hotel room. Right. You know, like a... But that's separate. It's kind of like it wouldn't show up on your credit card. It would be like a hotel bill. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious. I mean, do you want to go into like your ketamine therapy and how it helps you? Because you do seem like an example of someone that's used ketamine frequently for a long period of time and it's had a positive impact in your... I'm not like addicted to... Or delusional or like... Yeah, I didn't lose touch with reality in like a spooky way. Which is, yeah. And I, I have definitely known a number of people. So I'm sort of curious about how you navigate that and what effect it's had on you and why you're doing it and yep, like I'm, the whole deal. I'm up into it. So um, I started doing ketamine like recreationally. I don't know like what year exactly, but I had start like one of my childhood best friends is a, she's a psychedelic researcher and she does, she's a therapist. She's like an art therapist. That's her job. And um, she works with, I think, MDMA uh, research and she went to like a super hippy dippy college like but so I've been depressed like my entire life like miserably depressed like like the worst just nothing to live for yeah. um just broken brain yeah <laughs> and and normal things didn't work I assume oh yeah I tried like almost every SSRI under the sun in my teenage years. Like I took, I took mood stabilizers too. I took, and antipsychotics. I took Seroquel. I took Wellbutrin, Selexa, Cymbalta, Effexor, Prozac, and like three others. But that's a, like, that's a lot of medicine that's to give to like a teenager, especially I probably weighed like 75, 80 pounds at that point in my life. And I still have side effects from taking those or like in my early life. Like I have ringing in my ears and stuff that I never, oh, that I never experienced before uh, taking these drugs. Was there any positive element? Did it do anything for you? What did it feel like taking all of these SSRIs? I, well, SSRIs didn't work for me because I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's not like my kind of depression. Yeah. Like I was like suicidal, like, uh, they didn't really help me at all. The one thing that did help me, so I had more like tumultuous emotions and just feeling everything too much. And the one thing that I did benefit the most from was benzos for my anxiety uh-huh. and Seroquel. Oh, um, because during the day or at night? At night, at night. Or bed. Because I also had insomnia. I wasn't sleeping. I would go like five days without sleeping at like. 15 or something and you know i'm hallucinating at that point nothing is going right i'm in high school like it was awful and taking seroquel i wasn't having like delusions or anything but it just sort of if like a human being is a dial it just turned it down yeah so i could sleep i could eat i wasn't really feeling much of anything were you smoking weed a little bit, but not like regularly. Yeah. But when I did start smoking weed regularly, I actually noticed like everything was better. So that's what I did. Yeah. And again, my parents are cops, so they were super not down with the weed smoking. And yeah, so as an adult, I moved to LA, I started shooting porn and I was like really excited by life, but I still lived with depression and I was very sad. And so I did ketamine recreationally and I really wanted to do it uh, medicinally, but it was hard. Like this, I started doing ketamine therapy in 2018. Like it was hard to find back then. And I actually went through a whole process of, I found a therapist who was going to start working with this doctor and I started seeing her and I hated her. And then she finally started working with the doctor, but I didn't want to see her anymore, so I see I just saw him. Anyway, I'm rambling, but I started doing ketamine therapy, and when I did ketamine recreationally, I would get like I call it a reverse hangover. Like, if I did ketamine at night, 
the next day I would feel like just better. Like there was like a glow to life. Like it wasn't as dull. Like it was, there was more color in the world. I felt more capable, like literally like one of those depression, like SSRI commercials where like it's in black and white and then they take it and the color starts to leak back into life. And did it have any connection with the ketamine experience itself? Like, did you think something while you were on ketamine that then made you feel better the next day? Or was it like a purely biochemical effect? Like you just felt better? So when I was doing it recreationally, it was totally the chemical effect. Because I wasn't like getting high enough to have these like any thoughts really. You know, I was like in a club or with my friends and then doing it in a therapy setting with intention and going way deeper you know like it's like a the k-hole of all k-holes like it, it feels like a roller coaster literally like it feels like i'm moving through space um and these are iv infusions no intramuscular shots oh, okay got it yeah which i prefer like i think it would be stupid like if i was trying to be in a cable and i could feel an iv in my arm many people argue you can't feel it when you're on ketamine i would argue I'm quite aware. Right. Um, I've never done that either. I have done it and oh, I you, oh, hated yeah. it. Oh. Yeah. I went to like a ketamine clinic with anesthesiologists and I was like, this sucks. It was like weirdly sterile. I was in like a chair instead of on a couch. Was this in New York or in LA? In Las Vegas, actually. Oh, okay. But you could just pull up. Like they didn't care why you were there. You just had to answer a questionnaire because um, they weren't psychiatrists. They don't care. Right. They're like, you say you have a problem? Cool. Yeah. But after that, so I would ta I would do some talk therapy first. We would do the shot. And then I would spend like 45 minutes completely under like blackout um, eye covers, noise canceling headphones, and like an ambient music playlist. And then afterwards I would come out and I would think about the things I spoke about before I went under. And everything felt small. Like my problems seemed... A simpler more tolerable I felt more capable and it wasn't like I was having any like mind-blowing epiphanies while I was under my thoughts are way more abstract in like that state like I'm not thinking things things are just like swirling around in there yeah yes but do you ever get a kind of it's sort of what I imagine it would be like to be schizophrenic, like this this kind of uh, sense of privileged understanding of the universe, like, oh, 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 oh I get it. I get it. Oh, like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That's how it is. No. It's yes. all tubes. <laughs> and the tube connecting this is the same tube that connects to that. And like, Psychosis. Yeah, like, like <laughs> I figured it out. Now that you explain it like that, Not maybe that's what like the, wow, now all of my, like I feel more capable. It's kind of like a, oh, I get it. <laughs> I didn't get it before <laughs> and now I get it. But it, it's not that detached from reality for me. Like it feels very real. Well, I guess everyone's feels very real and that's why it's a problem, right? Cause they're being delusional. Yeah, and that it starts to feed into itself. I mean, this is kind of in the really extreme instances of, of ketamine. I've done a lot of ketamine, both therapeutically and non-therapeutically. And I've seen people just like leave their, like themselves. Like, like it feels different to talk to them and they feel totally normal and they think it's me or they think it's everyone else. And I, I just don't, I can't really relate to it. What do you think's happening to those people? I actually don't know because I feel like I also don't have the same experience with ketamine that many people do. Like, I can almost always walk and talk and, like, um, maintain a level of presence even when in a completely dissociated state. But I also have experience with dissociating without drugs. So... <laughs> right yeah i mean i i've spent so much time 
reading about these early ketamine addicts like John Lilly and Marsha Moore. And if, oh, yeah. The, the dolphin guy. The dolphin guy, yeah. And for him, it was like he could self-justify in really interesting ways because he was a genius and he's studying consciousness and why not do this to understand consciousness and who better than him to do this and he's finding out new things about consciousness and where it originates and but so could i if i did that much ketamine <laughs> if i did tunsi lily levels of ketamine i would be figuring out new consciousnesses like easy 60 milligrams an hour every hour 20 hours a day was the no you're fucking lying because you can't even like at that point your tolerance you're not feeling anything his claim is that he broke past it is that instead of becoming tolerant it was almost the opposite he became totally immersed in the k-hole in the k-hole the the oh so actually something i do know is people are convinced they're in it's not quite another dimension but it's like a it's like a lens over their perspective of the world. Does that make sense? Like yeah. a like a new like they're seeing in like four or five D instead of you know, reality. Well, he thought that he was an alien from the future. And because he was from the future, everything looked like it was from the past. So <laughs> <laughs> If he would look around oh, and everything was like an old movie. I want to get that high. Tone. Yeah. I want to get that high. Like, look at these primitive people with their newspapers and their... Well, ketamine you know, is also interesting because, like, I'll do a lot of ketamine because I'm like, it won't kill me. Yeah. That's also why I smoke a lot of weed. Like, I'm too scared of most everything. Like, my relationship with drugs has a lot to do with, like... Like, I'm a very moderate person, I would think, because... I don't want to ever come to like an unhealthy place where I feel like I need to stop doing drugs because I'm being like unhealthy. Exactly. Like I'm playing the long game. Exactly. <laughs> totally, totally feel the same way. I totally feel the same way. And when I see other people really behaving recklessly, I just think like, cool, you fucked it up for yourself. Now, now you have to stop. Now you have to stop. Like, <laughs> you like she could have. You do new stimulants at a reasonable level forever for writing emails every now and then, but you had to make it your only thing that you did. And yeah. now for the rest of your life, you have to be somebody that can never touch a stimulant or like weed or whatever. And I think it also has to do with just the way our culture treats drugs as a bad thing. So it's like, why would you be good about the bad thing? It's yeah. a bad thing. So, of course, if you're doing cocaine, you do it crazily. If you're drinking alcohol, you do it crazily. I don't think I've ever met someone who is also like, yeah, I'm playing the long game. Uh -huh. I'm not trying to stop. Well, it's, yeah, because I enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy this stuff. I don't want to. I also don't feel bad. Like, most of the time, I'm not having, like, a, like, my life isn't suffering. I'm not acting crazy and ruining my relationships. I'm not, like, hurting myself physically, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and. You know, some people do play the long game successfully, even with dissociatives, like Tim, to my friend Timothy Wiley, who like did ketamine his entire life and had like a really constructive relationship with it up until he was in his 80s. And uh, and it was partially because he just like understood how valuable it was to his artistic process and he didn't want to go into... He wasn't going to fuck it up. He wasn't going to fuck it up. And uh, I guess you just never hear those stories, like. Well, because what are you going to report? I did ketamine for a long time, and I'm normal. Like, those stories <laughs> just don't even exist. Like, uh, this used to always annoying about movies that depict drug use is they all have the same dramatic trajectory of, like, everything is fine, then they totally use the drug, then they end up destroying their life, then they might redeem themselves through sobriety and reflect. Or die. Or die. Or die. And that's... Virtually every movie ever made that depicts drug use with maybe the exception of Limitless, which is a very rare instance of a movie mm -hmm. about using drugs excessively that has a happy ending. <laughs> but you just don't really see that story. And that's because that drug doesn't exist. <laughs> yes, this is another. 
Like, if it was a drug that existed, it might may not have had that happy ending. I guess there's weed movies that have, that's maybe... Yeah, but, the, like, every weed movie is also, like, look at these stoners on the couch, smoking weed, eating chips, like, wearing tie-dye t-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Which, don't get me wrong, that is what I look like. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, our darling mutual friend Mira and I... We once tried to get so high that we wanted to go to the hospital on weed. Because <laughs> we hear you hear about it all the time. Like, I ate an edible and I begged my friends to take me to the emergency room. And Mira and I were like, oh, that could never happen to me. Should we try? Her husband was out of town. He left us unsupervised. We ordered the legal limit for both of us on, like, whatever delivery app in California. And then we ate, like maybe a thousand milligrams each and then we were just so stoned we couldn't move but we were not scared that's interesting yeah i've never i've only once really seriously overdosed on a cannabinoid and it was this drug called cp55940 which was like at the time why would you even do something like that it was i mean it's really a very well it was a very stupid thing <laughs> it, was, it was so dumb it was like you know, before synthetic cannabinoids became popular and like things you could get at bodegas, they were these like extremely rare, precious scientific commodities. Boo. And, <laughs> Just because it's rare doesn't mean it's cool. Well, for me, for like 22 year old me, it definitely, definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely did. And I didn't have access to analytical instruments at that time either. So I don't even know with certainty that it was CP55940. It may have been this other drug, but I'd never have analyzed the sample because I like paranoidly gave it away to a survivalist who hid it in his walls and I've never been able to get it back. But anyway, so I, it's so, so <laughs> the, the sample is on some guy's wall somewhere, but, um, don't incriminate yourself, babe. I don't think it's illegal. And I think, well, weed is legal in New York now, so, but I don't know about CP 55, 940. I think it is legal, but, but anyway, so I was like transferring it from a bag into a vial and I spilled some. And I was like, oh, it's so precious. Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't just like. Leave it there. I can't just dust it away. I can't. Back but I also it can't put it back with the rest of this untainted exactly, sample. Exactly, exactly. So I just licked up the unmeasured quantity. And it really didn't look like much. That was the other thing. I wouldn't have done it if it was a pile. It was like a very, 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 very small amount of powder. And I thought. Like, worst case scenario, I'll get very stoned, but not very, 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 very stoned. And I remember, like, doing it and getting stoned and thinking, like, yeah, yeah, this is awesome. Like, I love CP55940. And then? And then, like, a few hours passed, and I was like, oh, this hasn't peaked. Like, this is, this is on the upswing. That's the scariest feeling to have on an edible. Yeah, like, this is or, getting... you know, something like that. Yeah, like, this is getting... A lot stronger then i had this weird idea at the time this is was really stoned faulty logic where i was like if i smoke a lot of weed maybe it will displace the cp55940 from my cannabinoid receptors and will make me less stoned this is my so listen from a non-chemist <laughs> perspective every stoner has had that idea <laughs> every stoner has been like wait i'm getting too high in one direction and maybe if i just add more It'll change. And honestly, a lot of the time it does. Not from like a, I don't think it's a chemical thing necessarily of like displacing it from your <laughs> cannabinoid receptors. Well, it definitely didn't Help. solve the problem. <laughs> it also, as far as I know, probably didn't make it significantly worse. But I remember I did pass out after smoking the weed and I woke up the next morning. and With a weed hangover? And, no, 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 no. It was still getting strong. <laughs> And uh, and my vision was like vibrating and blurry, like I could barely see. And I had this meeting with an editor that morning, and I remember like leaving him this very tremulous, confused voice message that was like, "Hey, Jesse, uh, I think I've got food poisoning or something, and uh, I just feel I feel so bad. I just really have to reschedule." And uh, and like leaving that voice message. And then spending the rest of the day bedridden, too stoned to move or eat or do anything. Which only makes it worse. And that was the whole day. Fell asleep that night. Woke up extremely stoned the day after. So this is now getting into 
uh, probably like 36 hours somewhere in that vicinity. And it wasn't until that night, like a full 48 hours later that I was able to go outside and, and do anything. But I also never was like, I need to call an ambulance. I was just violently high. I was just, I was borderline anesthetized. I, think. <laughs> I was just like completely, I wasn't anxious. I was just. Well, that's the reason people go to the hospitals. They get anxious. They're scared. And I've, I've experienced fear on edibles before, but I'm a paranoid person. So weed paranoia. Like, sometimes I'll just be like, oh, it's the weed, man. Like, uh, like I remember once I was laying in bed, I ate, like, an edible. And my neighbor's dishwasher is, like, above my bedroom. And usually I love it. I'm like, oh, white noise. It yeah. sounds great. And this night, I was convinced it was going to fall through the floor and kill me. And I was sitting there and I was like, oh, my God, it's running. Why is it running? And, and then I had the realization, hey, you're weed paranoid. Take, I took like 2.5 milligrams of diazepam and I felt great. I was like, wow, crack the code, man. And just like, you know, not enough to literally feel anything. It just, just like took the, the bad part off. Yeah. Like scraping the foam off the top of a beer. Yeah. I haven't had too much of that. I've, I'm remarkably non paranoid, I think, but I have had it happen. I but did. you get super stoned and then you're just like, whoa, I'm so stoned. Yeah. But I'm also so neurotic about dosage. It's it's usually when there is some uncertainty. Those are the times where like some guy will like, you know, like slide into my DMs or something and say like, I make weed ice cream. Like, can I give you like five pints of weed ice cream? And I'll think like, yeah, hell yeah. Okay, sure. And then, and then like the guy will say something like, oh, there's 500 milligrams of THC in this ice cream. And it's like. But how'd you dose it? How do you know each bite has the same amount? It has the same amount. And, and like, I don't have a scale to weigh the pint. I don't know what the weight of the container is. Like, it, so like, there's no way to do accurate volumetric measurements. So I'll like take a little bit or something and then start to get afraid. Cause like, I started thinking like, I don't know that guy. Some dude that DM'd me. Like, <laughs> Also, we, I mean, that's, that's a separate thing. You're taking drugs from strangers, which. Terrible idea, I, which is what most people do. And I do it so rarely, pretty much only with weed products, because if someone gives me weed, like, sure. Yeah. Also, like, legality wise, that's pretty chill. Yeah. Yeah. I would You're never. Not... Exactly. But I mean, there's also like the way that weed works. Um, there was one edible that was stronger than anything else I'd ever had and it was this drink and it was only 45 milligrams per can but I remember someone came up to me like I was drinking it on a weed video set and she came up to me and she like snatched it out of my hand and she was like feeling it like how much of this did you drink like like weighing you know like trying to feel how much was gone out of the can and I was like I don't know like half I gave a couple people like sips and she was like do you smoke weed every day and I was like, yes. Uh -huh. She's like, how much? And I was like, I don't know, like over an eighth, like maybe a quarter of an ounce. And she's like, okay. Like she was scared for me. And then I drank it because I was like, I want to know what she's scared about. Uh -huh. And I have eaten like five times the measured amount. that Like I've eaten way more than 45 milligrams of weed like in an edible or whatever of THC and this drink made me like it felt like maybe the first time I had ever eaten a weed brownie like my eyes were low and red and glassy like I don't get red eyes ever and I was like whoa man that's that's so that's what weed is uh -huh. so I just think that like the way that edibles work I don't know the dosing is kind of inconsistent and like People metabolize it differently. And are you good at making it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 45 milligrams would destroy me. Even five is actually. Five would destroy you? Five will make me extremely, extremely, extremely strong. Yeah. They give five milligrams to, like, teenagers. I know. I somehow am not tolerant. I guess I just don't smoke enough to be 
I've never been able to like hang to hang on the on the like intense end of the spectrum. The thing is, like, I do obviously have a high tolerance for weed, but I also get super stoned. Like, it's not like, oh, I smoke and I don't feel anything. Yeah. Like, I get super stoned and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> weed's crazy. Like, I love having a stupid stoner moment and it happens all the time. Like, I'll leave my phone in the fridge or something <laughs> while I'm making a snack. Like, I'll do really like where I'm like, first time, first time smoking weed, man. It's really novel. It's cute. It sounds nice. I wish I could smoke weed during the day. I, I just find that I it's like not possible to do chemistry while while stoned. Yeah, I don't like I don't do drugs like at my work, but it's a little different, like with consent and stuff. Also, I, I don't know. I have a couple pictures from like after doing ketamine, and I look like someone took the soul out of my body. Like, I'm just going to show you a photo. It looks crazy. My brain, not there. But a lot of people think that, like, people do a lot of drugs on porn sets, which I find, like, kind of funny. Do they drink? They must drink occasionally or not. Not really. Really? I've only been on two sets ever that had had alcohol on them. And one was a really shitty guy who got, like, you know, he's out. He's been gone. And then another was like, and I'm not, I honestly advocate for this. Like another was this very well-known, very responsible performer. And she was doing an anal scene that day. And she wanted one glass of wine to just like literally loosen her up. Yeah. And she wasn't, no one else was drinking, only her. And it was her request. And she had worked with this director multiple times before. They've known each other like 10 years and I think that's kind of okay. You know, like people drink at, at least me at conventions and stuff. It's an incredible social lubricant. Like I'm way more excited and chatty and friendly Yeah. with like fans after I've had like a drink or two. Right. I don't think it's the worst thing that one could do. You were, but... say you were saying earlier that you didn't like or it was like weird when people come up to you on the street, but obviously a convention would be. Aha. <laughs> like what's happening? You look calm. You look relaxed. You look like you just had a massage. But the thing is like, I was like trying to be a person. Like if I zoom out, we're like, look at the other person in this bit. Like, I don't know what's happening. Is this on a set or you're just with a, I'm just with one of my friends who's also a performer. Got it. And she's doing ketamine too? Yeah. I mean, she doesn't look as fucked up as I do. Like, she looks kind of normal. It also could be I'm not wearing makeup. Like, you could see it's eight in the morning in this photo. <laughs> but I just look like nothing is going on in there. It's probably good. <laughs> I had a great time. <laughs> god forbid someone like sees me like <laughs> they would judge it yeah and that would suck because you know who cares right i mean most people when they have sex are intoxicated i imagine i actually that's like something that i didn't consider until not like very recently but semi-recently where i realized that like most of my sexual experience has been totally sober or like I smoke weed, but other people like meet at bars almost exclusively or like they meet on a dating app and they go out for a drink or they have dinner, but they have a drink with dinner. Like most people get fucked up to like date or hook up. Oh yeah. I think that's one of the primary functions of alcohol in our society is as a social lubricant specifically for romantic sexual encounters. Like that's why bars exist basically is for that purpose. I mean, I guess there's other people just like drink socially, but, but like that seems to be the thing. Yeah. Most people, uh, I, I like have a hard time even like conceptualizing that I'm like, cause I don't really drink much. 
Yeah, me neither. Um, I did have a drink today at the Russian bathhouse. The worker bullied me. Uh-huh. He was like, come on, you're not going to have a shot of vodka. And I was like, I'll have a shot if you have a shot. And he was like, okay, then we do tequila. Uh-huh. And he pulled it out. And my friend was next to me and he poured them one too. And they were, they're not drinking right now. And I, I was like, what? And now I have to drink both. And uh, I did. And then now I'm here. <laughs> I mean, I went in like the, the sauna and the schwitz and stuff. So I'm sure I like mostly sweat it out, but. I'm not a big drinker. I drink like maybe, I get drunk maybe 10 times a year, maybe. And sometimes I'll have like one beer and then I'm like, oh guys, it made me sleepy. Yeah. I could see that though. Like I would imagine, I guess their people on these sets are professional. So they're less, they're like mentally prepared, but for a normal person, they would definitely have to drink to like even to have sex with a stranger during the day with other people watching. Like it would just be so probably like so frightening. Yeah. I mean, a lot of us at a certain point, you know, everyone though, you know, I've been a performer for 10 years, so I'm speaking from like a certain place of privilege and experience, but most of the time I show up and I know you by now, like we've worked together. There are people out the, the first time I worked with them, I was 18 years old. So now I'm like, Hey, nice to see you again. Remember, I don't like spit. And uh, don't worry, I won't touch your butthole or like, you know, Ah. something like that. Like, we all know each other. So we're not like actually having sex with strangers anymore. At a certain point, you're just having sex with like acquaintances and like work friends. Right, 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 right. Such an interesting world, all of it, like... Do you, I I imagine OnlyFans was kind of like a really revolutionary sort of, like for me, the equivalent would be Patreon. Like, so OnlyFans has actually been around way longer than people think. Like it was around in like 2014 or 2015 and it was an app in the app store. Oh. And I was using it then and I was only making like maybe $200 a month from something like that. Because it was a, I mean, think about what iPhones were like back then. Right. Like the quality of a photo, fo- a quality of a photo was bad. Um, the user interface was still kind of bad. Like imagine what that app looked like. Right. It was awful. Yeah. Um, and I stopped using it because someone like stole all my pictures and put them on Reddit. Yeah. And I was like, fuck this. I'm not making enough money to use this. Yeah. Um, and then they took it out of the app store and... Then, you know, four, three or four years ago, it came back. Um, but that's because one of the biggest live stream cam websites, the owner bought OnlyFans. So. Right. So it was, it is revolutionary and I do really like it. Um, it's just sad that there was the like gap in the market that it now, you know, lives in. Like. Someone should have done it sooner. Right. It shouldn't have like, we shouldn't have needed to wait. That's not English. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it took so long for someone to be like, hmm, what about like Twitter, but for porn? I think everyone was so accustomed to seeing the internet as a free place, especially when it came to individual user generated content like the idea was if you're going to pay for something it would have to be like from amazon or something like that but you would never pay for something that an individual made straight from that individual well you know patreon used to allow sex work and then they kicked us all off at one point and like i know a bunch of people who wrote like an open letter being like hey this is not cool and they were like sorry you're high risk bye so dumb i mean a lot of it comes from like credit card companies but then the credit card companies are getting lobbied by like far-right christian organizations saying that like they're allowing like child sexual assault material and stuff online right but also the same people who are like being like we should get rid of this are calling it child porn which it shouldn't be called it's child sexual assault material like when you like i don't know words mean things yeah yeah Yeah, I guess it does introduce this whole content moderation issue for them because as long as it's not 
adult content, then they just don't moderate anything. Exactly, because adult content also falls under, like, there are obscenity laws that vary from state to state. Yeah. And that's, like, the biggest issue. That's why most porn websites will be, like, verify that you're over 21. Because in certain jurisdictions, it's not 18, it's 21. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, the drug stuff also, of course, has an issue on YouTube. Like, I can't monetize any videos that I make on YouTube. They just all get demonetized. Yep. Because some because of the content because of the content will be seen as promoting drug use or whatever sort of like educational yeah 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 i mean i'm like shadow banned on instagram like nobody sees my posts if you type in my name like seven fake accounts come up before i do which is so funny because instagram is already like like how much instagram traffic is essentially softcore porn it's hardcore porn actually like i see hardcore fucking on instagram regularly it's crazy and i get deleted for show like because someone got a hard on when they looked at me fully clothed huh. like <laughs> um no i get tagged in like these spam bot accounts and it'll be like either a scene of me or someone else or like some amateur sex tape and i report it because i'm like maybe there shouldn't be like hardcore porn like i should be allowed to post cleavage but I just, that's not what Instagram's for, you know? Like, we know that that's not what Instagram is for. Twitter, like, explicitly allows adult content. Right. Go on Twitter if you want to watch fucking on your social media, that is. Yeah. Oh, man. It's just like going to the strip club and being like, why aren't you fucking me? And it's like, well, that's not what we do at a strip club. Yeah. Oh, man. Are there any final things you think people should know about... No. Drugs, you, the industry? Not that I can think of. Do you have any final questions? Did I answer your ketamine experience question? Well, well yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, do you, do you think you have, like, a secret for why the outcome of your long-term ketamine use both therapeutic and recreational has been positive again i think it's like i'm playing the long game yeah like i just like can sort of have this uh foresight to know like okay like things are getting a little a little spooky um which hasn't really happened to me on ketamine like i've gone on a bender but that's like it's kind of intentional and it's fun. You know, like I'll stay up for like two days with my friends, like getting high on ketamine and then watching like weird old art house movies on the Criterion channel. Like we're not doing anything crazy. Yeah. And then I'll sleep and have a normal night of sleep and then go back to my life. And I have no like desire to keep doing it. I don't feel any like urge to get high I don't, know, I don't know what the secret is yeah it's also probably whatever is wrong with my brain ha <laughs> that's good good to hear a positive story especially because this telemedicine stuff is just going to continue once the template is set for something to get bad publicity people just start robotically repeating it like it was just a matter of time before this happened yeah yeah also like people don't understand psychiatry like i said like they think that a psychiatrist like actually talks to you when most of the time they meet you for 15 minutes and they read your notes from your therapist and then they write you a, a prescription like they don't know shit about you yeah if they even look at my psychiatrist certainly never looks at any notes from my therapist or has never spoken with my therapist what yeah that's crazy yeah. but my psychiatrist and my therapist are one person so yeah he doesn't have to. Like, he knows what we talked about in therapy. Huh. He did it. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.